All right. Good morning, everybody. Today is uh, April the 17th, 2022, and it's Easter Sunday. Um, I'm not going to give an Easter message, but we do talk about the resurrection every day. So just want to remind you, I want to say hi to uh, David, Melinda, in Canada. Who else? Uh, 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 Dawn, Dawn, if you're, if you're watching it, hello. And um, what else? Who else? I want to remind you that next week is going to be the spring cookout. Two weeks. Do you see why I have her by, as my wife? Okay. Two weeks. May 1st, okay. They'll probably have us working down in the flooded basement. Who knows? You know, because that, when they were gone, the basement got flooded. But, but it's, a, it's a, a bring your favorite dish. Um, Sign-up sheets are on the grazing table. And um, May 1st, after after. A, after we preach here at the church. Now, if you would go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, let me read you verses um, 13 to 18. We're still talking about the rapture. This is 1 Thessalonians lesson number 125. And this is talk about, talking about our catching away, our rapture, the church, the body of Christ. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, now there's the resurrection, okay? Even so them which also sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. That's a nice term for, for people who are dead. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with him, wherefore comfort one another with these words. Dear Lord, thank you once again for this time in your word. The for the light that rightly dividing shines, it's like the sun coming here. We, we travel east, so the sun's in our eyes all the time coming here, but it's, it's like the light from your word that your word gives to us when we know how to study the Bible, when we, we study it dispensationally. Thank you for the Apostle Paul. Thank you for his 13 epistles. Thank you for the whole Bible. And thank you for what your son did on the cross. He died. He paid the debt for our sins. He was buried and he rose again the third day. And a lot of people on this day, they call it Easter, they, they, they worship it on this day, but... We worship the resurrection of Christ every day. So, now, a little bit of review. In Hebrews 9, 20, 28, it talks about, this is what you had the last part of the last lesson. He's going to appear the second time. It's about the second coming. But there have been many comings of the Lord, if you recall last week. In John 20, if you go there, John chapter 20, verses 16 and 17, Jesus Christ is resurrected. And Mary looks for him. He tells Mary, touch me not. I want you to go also to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew 28. Talking about Mary Magdalene. In Matthew... Twenty-eight and verse nine. And as they went, this is after his death. Now, went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, "All hail!" And they came and held him by his feet, and worshipped him. Now, I had you go to John chapter twenty. Let me read you verses sixteen. 17. Jesus saith unto her, Mary, she turned herself and saith unto him, Rabboni, which is the same master. Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my father, 
But go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father, and to my God and your God. This happened before Matthew 28, 9. Okay? The event in John happened before that, first. Now, there is about a two-hour time period, two to three-hour time period between these events. Jesus Christ had gone into the third heaven. He appeared before the Father, and he, sent, he ascended back down to come to earth. This is quick, interplanetary, intergalactic travel. This is what a resurrected body can do. We are going to receive this kind of body. Time, space, and distance won't mean anything. Now, that brother who's, who's gone now, he was a pilot. When he started, when, he, when, I, when we finally got saved, and I brought up this to him one time, he got really excited because he was a pilot and he loved being in the air. He got his, he got his pilot's license before he had his, got his driver's license. I drove him to his first solo. And when I got out of the service in 1970, he said, let's go up in a plane. I probably told the story before. And I did. So then he turned off the engine and it dropped. And I was eating my stomach. And I got off that plane and never even came close to a plane since then. Because that just, you know, scared the bejesus out of me. It's just crazy. So this is something to think about. Imagine having a body that can travel to the third heaven and come back and, you know, and time and space and distance, they don't mean anything to you. We're, we're lucky. We get, get a new bottle. It's, it's a body. It says no more baldness, no more bridge work, no more um, um, bifocals, no more bulges, no more bunions. You know, we're going to have a brand new body able to do this. Some people might be laughing, but don't laugh. If, if you want to do this, get saved, and you'll be given a new body when you die, when Christ comes to, to get us, to bring us up to the third heaven. So, so he let a group of women hold his feet. And what, so what happened between his return and ascension? I just to, told you, the ascension and return. Why wouldn't that be the second coming or the third or fourth coming? There are many appearings of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Acts chapter 1, we read it last week, he ascends and he's going to come back. He already did it once. So here is another coming. In John 6, 6, 62, he is prophesying about his ascension. Who sees it? He says, ye. Okay? And Acts 1, ascension is, that took place, Jesus Christ already told them he's going to do it and that they would see him do it. This one is a private believer's only appearance. So we're going to continue to show some of these things. And as per usual, I'm always going to infer, in, in, um, they're always going to be heavy on studying the Bible dispensationally and knowing about the nation of Israel. Those are the most important things. If the more you know about Israel and their program, the easier this becomes. I mean, it's not hard to understand that, but if you're brought up with a, with a religious mindset and you don't have much Bible, the Bible turns out to be a book that's brand new to people who have been in the Bible all their lives, who are saved, but they don't rightly divide. So, we continue to do this in Acts chapter 1, verses 2 and 3 on your outline. Until the day in which he was taken up, after that he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. I think he's liking it. Yeah. To whom also he showed himself alive after his passion, that means after his suffering, by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Forty days with the ascended and then come back down to earth, Jesus Christ. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that? Did they get any sleep? Did they eat? Did they take bathroom breaks? I suppose so. But 40 days. Acts 9.17. This is where Saul gets saved on the road to Damascus. And Ananias went his way and entered it in the house and putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, hath sent me that thou mightest, mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. Now he physically came back and appeared to Paul. And Ananias saw him in a vision. God told him what to do. 
So these are all comings or appearings, whatever you want to call it. In Acts 26, there's three more places, places in Acts that Paul talks about what happened in Acts 9. Two more places. Verses 15 and 16, And I said, Who art thou, Lord? This is Paul talking about his experience in Acts 9. He said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. Remember when I told you that there's three people back in the Old Testament who asked the name of the Lord and they weren't given the name? Why was Paul given the name Jesus? Do you think it has something to do with him completing our canon of Scripture? Do you think it has something to do with the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery? To make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery? Do you think this particular doctrine that's in Scripture, when you present it to religious people, and I don't, I use the word religious in, in, a, in a bad sense, because they teach you not to read your Bible. Do you think this, this is what causes them to be angry? Because 13 of the 27 books in the New Testament is about Paul and about what Christ did on the cross. It's what, what Christ accomplished on the cross. Remember the biggest piece of news, best piece of news to mankind is 1 Corinthians 2, 6-8. If Satan had known what the cross work accomplished, Christ would not have been sacrificed, killed. Okay? The 1 Corinthians 2, 6-8. Memorize that passage. So, He says, Who art thou? I am Jesus, and not persecutest, but rise and stand upon thy feet. For I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in the which I will appear unto me, unto thee. Now, how come the people won't believe this, but they'll believe it for they're reading the Gospels, the red letters in the Gospels? When Jesus Christ is here physically on the earth, to come for the nation of Israel. How come they won't believe this? Now, 1 Corinthians 15, 8, And last of all, he who has seen of me also is one born out of due time. Um, this is the only time this, the word for born, this Greek word for born is used, and it means to abort, an abortion. God aborted Saul out of Judaism to usher in the dispensation of grace. Paul, Saul was a type of the Antichrist before he got saved. Now, I want to take this and just talk about this a little bit. There's certain verses I say, I say over and over again. There's one born out of due time. In due time, something's going to happen. Paul was the due time testifier. In due time, that was a mystery. But when the world came, when Israel fell physically, then Israel fell spiritually in Acts chapter 7, Armageddon was supposed to happen. That did not happen. This is what our Bible teaches. God reaches down and saves Saul, saves Saul on the road to Damascus. And he, and he appears to Saul and he tells him what to do. He's his chosen vessel for this dispensation. And so many folks don't want to understand that. There's, if you go to Colossians chapter 1, Colossians 1, And then I want you to get Revelation 17. Colossians 1 and Revelation 17. Now, in Colossians 1.25, Paul says, Where if I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you, to fulfill the word of God. Even the mystery which hath been hid from ages to come, I mean from, from, from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus, whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. He wants the word to work in us mightily. It's a word that worketh effectually in those that believe. So, verse 25 again. According to this dispensation, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Now, that's the only time that phrase is used. Okay? The only time. 
The closest thing that comes to this, that comes to Colossians 125, is in Revelation 17. Now, what's going on in Revelation 17? What's going on in Revelation? Again, on the chart behind me, I don't know if everybody can see it. This yellow section is the last 2,000 years, the dispensation of grace. The Gospels and all that before Paul. No, to my right, to, to my left, you're right. This time over here, this is Hebrews to Revelation. This is when the, the, God's going to purge his nation. And again, this is the most written about topic in the Bible, this prophesied wrath. So Revelation 17, I just lost my place here. Let me give you a couple of highlights of the, uh, of the passage, the chapter. It's talked about, and upon her forehead was the name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the Mother of Harlots, and the Abominations of the Earth. Verse 8, And the beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, and go into perdition. Um, verse 9, And here is the mind which hath wisdom, the seven heads are, are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. And there are seven kings, five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth, and is the seven, and goeth into perdition. This sounds like the book of Daniel. This sounds like Matthew 24 and 25. It's called about great tribulation. And, and the ten horns, well, that sounds interesting, doesn't it? Which thou sawest are ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the lamb, and the lamb shall overcome them, for he is the Lord of lords and king of kings. And they that are with him are called chosen and faithful. He saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the horse sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. Now here's the verse I want you to compare with Colossians 1.25. For God hath, not, hath put it in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree and give their kingdom unto the beast until the words of God shall be fulfilled. Now, this is not completing the word of God, as Paul says in Colossians 1.25. This is John writing about the fulfillment, the culmination of God's long prophesied final judgment for the nation of Israel. The most written about topic in the Bible. And then on the nations who hated Israel. Israel. This is called prophecy. Again, the time of Jacob's trouble. Um, and back up to Revelation 16. Look at verse 16. And he gathered them together in a place in the Hebrew, called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. You know what the word Armageddon means? The Mount of Slaughter. Does Paul talk about this? No. If you go to Revelation 14, Revelation 14, look at verse 7. Sing with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the foundation and the fountains of waters. Wow. Matthew 24 and 25 talks about the Great Tribulation. Revelation 14 is talking about the Great Tribulation, Armageddon, the time of Jacob's trouble, as we know it. This has nothing to do with the dispensation of grace. And this is why we write the divide. We don't write the divide truth from untruth. We write the divide truth from truth. And what I'm reading here in Revelations is truth. But the last seven years of Israel's punishment has not happened yet. And if you think it's not going to happen, you're negating the most written about topic in the Bible, and you are calling God a liar. I don't know any other way to say it, 
but plain and simple. You're lying. You're not believing the words. You're putting something else in, into the context that's not in there. Paul says we're going to be taken out before that time. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. How much comfort would you have if you thought you were going to go through this tomorrow? People think that don't write the divide. There's a lot going on in the world now, but there's always been a lot going on in the world that isn't good. So all I'm trying to do is give you some sense of what's going on. Paul says that by me the preaching might be fully known. In 2 Timothy 4.8, he says, and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom. Now that phrase is never found anywhere in Scripture. And the phrase heavenly kingdom is only found right there. Now these, I look at this, I was thinking about this yesterday. If you had a big jigsaw puzzle, let's say 50,000 word jigsaw puzzle, right? And you took 2 Timothy, put it right in the middle. You put it in the middle because you understand rightly dividing the word of truth. And then you start feeling all these other truths. You start filling in that puzzle and it starts getting big. All these truths, all these things that you didn't know about, you can see now, but you couldn't see because you were blinded either by your own heart or by somebody else's teaching. Study to show thyself, you singular, personally. All right? Study to show thyself a proven unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. This is all a piece of the jigsaw puzzle, rightly dividing, dispensational right in the middle. All these other truths come out, and it starts getting clearer and clearer and clearer. And before long, your root is sunk, and nobody can shake you around too much because you have, you're, you're really grounded in the truth. And it's up to us to fill in the piece of that jigsaw puzzle. Now, back to your outline. So how many appearings and comings are there? 1 Corinthians 9.1 Paul says, Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ, O Lord? And not in my work in the Lord? Paul saw Jesus Christ. Appearings of Jesus Christ take three forms. Open appearings. Revelation 1.7 Behold, he cometh with the clouds, and every eye shall see him. And that day, and that future day, called the ages to come in our Bible, after God purges Israel, he's going to attack the nations that attacked in his nation. Because it's to all peoples now. The second type of appearing is secret appearings. Only the certain believers can see him. Like Luke 24, in the upper room, only to the apostles. Acts 9, only to Paul. Number three, masked, masked appearance. Luke 24, 16. But their eyes were, were holding they should, that they should not know him. The two on the road to Emmaus. Okay? This is talking about Mary. And they saw him, but they didn't know him yet. John 20, verse 15. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She, supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto him, Sir, if thou hast have borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. That's Mary Magdalene. Why is this important? Why do you think it's important for me to come to this church every Sunday and teach this? Paul says in 2 Timothy 4.8, Henceforth there is a laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. First Thessalonians 4, he appears in the sky. He doesn't come back down to the earth. This is part of the revelation of the mystery. This is to the, 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 the make all men's, the fellowship of the mystery. This is what God wants all Christians to know, every Christian. And if you call yourself a Christian and you think you can lose your salvation, I'm not trying to hurt your feelings, but you're not a Christian. You have not trusted in the sufficiency of Christ's sacrifice, in the sufficiency of the cross, in the preaching of the cross. You have not trusted in that. 
the faith of Jesus Christ and our faith in that. Two two-letter words, of and in. Colossians 3, 4. When Christ, who was our life, shall appear, then shall he also appear with him in glory. He doesn't come down and knocks on your door. Come on, let's go out here. I'll take you up. We're going to see him. In the, we're going to be up there. Be taken raptured up with him in the, in the air there. 2 Timothy 1, 9 through 11. Who hath saved us. He's not saving us. He hath saved us and called us within holy calling, not according to our works, but to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. His faith is counted for righteousness. Believing is not a work. We are called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. But now is made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death, and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles. Which appearing was this? The one beginning in Acts chapter 9. You can read about that. Now, it says here, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Did God predetermine certain people's salvation? No, there's not. Absolutely not. If you're in... If you're in Christ Jesus, that means if you're saved today, if you've trusted in the cross work, his, 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 the shed blood, paying the debt for all your sins, his burial and his resurrection, if you've trusted in that, well, this appearing was the first this important piece of information. This appearing, now listen, was the first and the only time the Lord appeared to a non-believer post-resurrection. Here's another piece of that puzzle. Paul was the only unsaved person who appeared after, his, after the cross. The only unsaved person. That's a huge piece of the puzzle. 50,000 words, you've got to get a lot, of, a lot of chunks in there, right? All previous appearings in his post-resurrection ministry were believers. And the appearing to Paul changed everything. At that appearing, nobody in Paul's company could see or understand, only Paul. So the beginning of the dispensation of grace was a personal appearing of Christ to Paul. The end of the dispensation of grace will be a personal appearance to and for the body of Christ from heaven. It sounds similar because the dispensation of grace will conclude the same way it began with an appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul is our pattern, it says in 1 Timothy 1.16, for salvation. So what happened to him in Acts 9 is prologue to what will happen to us at our departure from earth. Paul was a Jew by birth and a Gentile by citizenship. He could go to either group. He takes... There's no difference now in God's eyes. No distinction between male and female, bond or free, Jew or Gentile. Again, when Jesus Christ saved Paul, well, when Jesus Christ saved Paul, something unique took place. Jesus Christ came personally for Paul. He did not send an angel. He will come personally for us, the church, the body of Christ. Colossians 3, 4. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then ye also appear with him in glory. Then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Not in perdition, not in anger, but in glory. Acts 9, 3. And as he came near Damascus, this is Paul getting saved, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. 
Now, in Matthew 24, it takes a process of time for the second advent of Christ to the earth. At least three days. Nothing sudden happens like it does in Acts 9. Ours will be sudden. He appears in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, and we shall be changed. 1 Corinthians 15, 52. With Paul, it was a secret appearing. When he comes for us, there will be no signs, no warnings, no things that need to be fulfilled. Go to 1 Timothy 3 and 2, 1 Timothy 4 and 2 Timothy 3. 1 Timothy 4 and 2 Timothy chapter 3. There will be no signs or warnings or things need to be fulfilled. Now I use these passages to show something. 1 Timothy 4. Now the Spirit expresseth now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times, I'm using this for the latter times, some people think it's over here, but it's not. Some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Is this only exclusive to the dispensation of grace, or is this true of mankind since the beginning? Look at the next verse. Now, this reminds me of the way we grew up. Forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. Well, in, in Genesis 9, you could, you could uh, before Genesis 9, all they ate was fruit and veggies, plants. In Genesis 9, now you can eat meat. Then in Leviticus, to Israel, there's kosher. You can only eat certain things. But now in the dispensation of grace, you can eat anything as long as you thank God for the food. That's a little bit of rightly dividing right there. Okay? But first, 2 Timothy chapter 3, this no, verse 1, this know also that in the last days, so we have the latter times and the last days. This is the latter times and the last days of the dispensation of grace. Period. All right? Big period with exclamation part. And in the last days, perilous times shall come. Are we in those days? Yes. Did these days happen before in the last 2,000 years? Yes. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Well, nothing new about that, right? Covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. How many of you have ever filled any one of those things? You don't have to raise your hands. Without natural affection, truth speakers, what, what gives you natural affection? What did Sam teach you about? What was the most of these three things abide? Faith, hope, and charity. The greatest of these is charity. That's the valuing and esteeming others above yourself. That's wanting to get this message to other people, regardless of who they are, what they are, where they are, because we're all deserving of hell. That's the natural affection that God puts in you through understanding the grace and the dispensation of the grace of God. If you don't want to understand the dispensation, you will not have that charity, that kind of love. Without natural affection, truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures, more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, that's religious works. Now, I want to ask you a question. What if I came in here next week with a big robe on and collar and these beads, and I passed out the plate? Would you guys stay for the sermon? Probably walk out the door, right? Maybe you throw rocks at me. Make them little ones. I'm old. Huh? <laughs> now, how many of you think that's ever going to happen? Ain't going to happen. But that's having a form of godliness. 
but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. Why wasn't I taught to turn away from that? Why wasn't Debbie? Why weren't people who grew up in the Catholic Church? We love Catholics, we just don't love the religion, as Sam said. Why weren't we taught that? Because they were ignorant of it. They were taught like their parents were taught, like their parents were taught, and so on and so forth, all the way down the line. Let somebody else take over the education of your mind, the way God's working today. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with divers' lusts. This is a good one. Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Wow. You know what this means? Every time you go to witness to somebody and they get angry with you, think of this verse. Memorize it. First, Second Timothy 3, verse 7. Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. You can learn a lot of things about the nation of Israel and about their program. And I want you to do that. But if you think that's part for you, then we're not on the same page. You're not on the same page with God. Because under that program, you're under the law. You have to endure to the end. You have to do things to show your faith and all that. Not today. Salvation is a free gift. You either accept it or you reject it. Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds are reprobate concerning the faith. But they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men, as theirs also was. But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, and so on and so forth. But when has, hasn't this been true of mankind? All these words in this chapter. It's always been true of mankind. So it's not a, a prophesied thing. These, in 1 Timothy 4 and 2 Timothy 3, these things are common to mankind from the beginning. Next page on your outline. When Paul gives his testimony, he prays, he prays it a little, he says it a little different each time. In Acts 9, 7, it says, And the men which journeyed with him, journeyed with him, stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. Acts 22, 9, And they that were with me saw indeed the light, but were afraid. But they heard not the voice of him that spake to me. This means it was only for Paul, so that only he understood. Not for Peter, James, or John, or any of the twelve apostles. Acts 26, 14. And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me, and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to get, kick against the pricks. More examples. John 12, 27 and 29. During the earthly ministry of Christ. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this cause came I unto this hour. He knows what he's going to experience on the cross. Father, Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have, I have both glorified it and I will glorify it, glorify it again. The people therefore that stood by and heard it said that it thundered. Others said an angel spake to him. So they heard the sound of thunder, not the words. Do you remember the judicial judgment God puts upon the nation of Israel? He says, seeing you're not going to see, hearing you're not going to hear. In Matthew 13, he starts speaking in parables to the little flock because the nation would not believe him. In other words, I'm going to give you what you want. You're not going to understand me now. You're going to go to hell. Thank God he's not doing that now. We get chance after chance after chance. Okay? So... This judgment, this saying, how can I say this? Um, go, to, go to Romans 11. Well, actually, go to Isaiah 6. Isaiah 6. In Isaiah chapter 6, you see this about, how would you get there? Isaiah 6. Now, this judicial judgment is seen seven times in the Bible. Okay, Isaiah, 
all four of the Gospels and all that. Here's where it begins. Isaiah 6, verse 9. He said, Go and tell this people, Hear, hear ye indeed, but understand not, and see ye indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people fit, make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts, and convert and be healed. Because of their... Well... When I just read you John 12, they thundered. They heard the sounds of thunder, not the words. I forgot to give you a verse here. Job 37, verse 5. God thundered marvelously with his voice. Great things doeth he which we cannot comprehend. So God is to be feared. That means that being reverence. Um, because of the great works. Fear mingled with, re with respect and affection. Now, you see this little section here from here down to first... Um, it's kind of like a commercial about the nation of Israel. Because of their apostasy, because of their disobedience, because of their rebellion, there was a reoccurring theme for the nation of Israel. Understanding Israel's relationship with God is critical to understanding your Bible. This knowledge is what leads us to Pauline Truth, 13 of the 27 New Testament books. And again, I'm a broken record. There are many saved Christians out there. I understand that. I'm thankful for that. But they don't understand this truth. Comprehending, to comprehending the last 2,000 years of God's grace, peace, mercy, instead of judgment. He's offering, for the last 2,000 years, peace, mercy, and not judgment, and grace. Peace, mercy, and grace. What happens when you get into the Hebrew epistles? Read words like, our God is a consuming fire. They draw back under perdition. These, the, the pit opens up and ascends all these creatures from hell. You're going to be stung with their scorpion. You're not going to be able to die for five months. You can't even kill yourself. This is the prophesied judgment God put on the nation of Israel, then on the nations that went against his nation. So here's another time it says this in Isaiah, from Isaiah chapter 6. Acts 20, 28, 26, and 27. Now, this is the third time and the last time Paul goes to the nation, the leaders. He says, saying, go unto this people and say, hearing ye shall hear and shall not understand, and receiving ye shall see and not perceive. For the heart of this people is waxed growth, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have they closed, lest they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. They heard noise, not words. Now, I just quoted this in Isaiah 6, didn't I? This is a judicial judgment. Now, so we've seen it once in Isaiah 6, once in Acts 28, Jews five more times in Matthew 13, 14, Mark 4, 12, Luke 8, 10, John 12, verse 40, and then go to Romans 11 and verse 8, and Romans 9, 10, and 11, in the book of Romans is called the National Section, where God explains about what happened to Israel. Romans chapter 11, verse 8. Instead of verse 7. What then? It says, National Israel judicially blinded. What then? Israel hath not obtained what he, which he seeketh for, but the election hath attained it, and the rest were blinded. According as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes, that they should not see and ears that they should not hear unto this day. Judicial judgment. Now the word lest here, in these, I, I highlighted in these two passages in your, on your outline here, signifies that the destinies of these people were not fixed by an eternal decree. We have free will. I can show that in Proverbs 29, verse 1. He that being oft reproved, hardeneth his neck, shall suddenly be destroyed in that without cause. Now verses like this disprove Calvinism. Even when it said God had him do this, God knew what they were going to do. They do it on their own. They have free will. In his earthly ministry of Christ, in the earthly ministry of Christ, there were two groups. One, those who rejected him, and two, those that followed him. Starting in Matthew 13, I said this earlier, 
Christ started speaking in parables to the unbelieving Jews. This was a punishment. The nation is not responding. The vine tree talks about in Isaiah chapter 5. The little flock, the little flock, in, in the, the, the believers of Israel, in Luke chapter 12, verse 32. Now, that's the commercial for Israel. Let's break down 1 Thessalonians 4.16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. There are three unique sounds in this event. One, with a shout. Two, with the voice of the archangel. And three, with the trump of God. When this happens for us, the world will hear the noise and say it thundered. We will hear the words, we will understand what's being said. It doesn't make us better than anybody else, but it makes us better off, because we know where we're going to go. This is why we call it a secret appearing. Christ, others will hear, but not understand. We will see the Lord himself descend from heaven. We will see the dead in Christ rise. We will be translated, caught up with them. We will experience our meeting in the air. We will start our presence with the Lord forever. The word translated means transfer from one place to another, remove to heaven without dying. That's Genesis 5. Remove, change, and carry over. And Hebrews 11.5, by faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God hath translated him for before his translation, he had this te testimony that he pleased God. Now today, for the last 2,000 years, the first way to please God is to get saved. And understand you're a sinner. You can't save yourself. That is crucial. That helps you grow up. Men, not as though we fully grow up. You women know that. Okay? But that helps us to grow up, to see the truth and to... Well, it makes you stand fast. It's a, it's a life-changing moment when you understand how to study the Bible. In Genesis 5, 22 to 24, And Enoch walked with God. After that, he begat Methuselah 300 years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Isn't that? That's, that's 365 days in a year. Um, and Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. God's going to take us. He says in Galatians, Paul, Paul says in Galatians 1.6, I marvel not that you are so soon removed. It's the same word as translated in Hebrews 11.5. From him that calls you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. The Judaizers out there are trying to get you to say that the gospel of the kingdom is the thing that saves, or there's only one gospel in the Bible, the gospel of the kingdom, when you can clearly see that there's at least one more gospel, there's more than that, but the gospel of the grace of God. Okay? The gospel of Christ, the gospel of, of Jesus Christ, the gospel of, you know, of peace. Some of those things are interdispensational. In Hebrews 7, 12, for the priesthood being changed, there's the same word in, in, in uh, Hebrews 11, 5, there was made a necessity, a change also of the law. Paul mentioned nothing about priesthood with regard to us, which supports the activity in the Hebrew epistles as yet to come. Because there, if you don't get the mark, if you get the mark of the beast, there's no more chance for you, for you to be written in the book of life. You're taken out. There, if you're not saved as a Gentile, you don't have to get water baptized, as some people think. But you better help Jews that believe Christ if you get the opportunity. If you don't, you're not going to heaven. There is no last trump in the book of Revelation. There is no seventh trumpet in 1 Corinthians 15 or anywhere else in the Bible. Check it out. Yourself. Now, I want you to go to Romans chapter 2. Just a few more verses. We're getting close. How many of you heard of the word immortal or immortality? 
Are those words in the Bible? Okay. The word immortality is used five times in Scripture. Let me show you where they're found. Romans 2, 7. To them who by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. Go to 1 Corinthians 15. I want to read these verses to you. 1 Corinthians 15. Verse 53. For this corruptible must put on incorruption in this mortal must put on immortality. Remember those new bodies I talked about? Verse 54. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. We have the victory, folks. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. And look at verse 15 and 16. Which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honor and power and everlasting. Amen who only hath immortality. And then 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 10. But is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to life through the gospel. Now, did you see what section of scripture that word is used in? It's all in Paul's epistles, aren't they? Jesus Christ is immortal. Only he can give immortality. If you go to 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 17, no wonder the king eternal, immortal, Invisible. The only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Only an immortal being can give us immortality. Now the Jews understood in the past that they were going to live, you know, resurrect. But the word immortal, immortality, when you find out these phrases and the words that are used exclusively in Paul, you start filling in that jigsaw puzzle when you understand it. More and more things become clear to you and they, they well, only God... Our God is the only immortal being, the one who gives immortality to his believers. So, regarding our translation, being caught up, the world will not see it or hear it. Just as prophecy ended when Christ revealed himself to Paul, prophecy will resume when Christ reveals himself to to the body of Christ. So for those that are listening and watching, I always close with an invitation. Salvation. Christ died for your sins. Don't take a chance that this is false, this information. If you've ever sat down and studied the Bible, or if you never have, you should think again. Understand the fact that you don't have to come to a church to get saved. You don't have to do anything to get saved other than believe in the privacy of your heart that Christ died for your sins. That moment, that instant, you're indwelt by God the Holy Spirit and you're sealed unto the day of redemption. You can't see anything, hear anything, and do anything, or feel anything, but it's there because you know it by the Word of God. The Word of God should be your final authority in all matters. So please consider that. Amen. Thank you.